Tom, would you like to make the introductions? Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Sephardic World brought to you by the Sephardic Genealogical Society. As always, we thank our patrons who are with us here on Zoom, and we welcome our viewers on YouTube. And we welcome Professor Ron Hausner, who will uh, talk about his latest book, Anatomy of Torture Studies, uh, about how the Spanish Inquisition used torture as a tool to extract information from their prisoners. And he will present some uh, surprising results from his uh, research. Now his research is focused on torture, and in this case, it happened to be the Spanish Inquisition, so he's not into genealogy as such. But uh, of course, he understands a lot about how the Inquisition works and can tell us about that. So uh, I give the word to uh, Ron Hasner. And thank you, Ron, for being with us here today. Thank you, Ton, for this uh, kind introduction. So hello, everybody. I'm going to um, start by sharing my screen so we can all see the same thing. Does this work? Is it nicely all screen? Yes. Fantastic. So uh, as, as Ton indicated uh, in his introduction, I'm not a genealogist. Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, Sephardic history. I'm not a historian. I'm a political scientist, and I study the intersection of religion and conflict. Uh, at UC Berkeley, which you, uh, which you see behind me, I teach classes on war and war in the Middle East and Israel studies. Uh, so I come to the topic of torture from a, uh, a sort of social science direction. Nonetheless, I think that my research may have uh, some bearing on uh, the topics that this audience is interested in. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, David and Ton for inviting me. It's, it's an honor uh, and a delight to meet this particular group. Here's the cover page uh, of my book. It's called Anatomy of Torture. It came out with Cornell University Press uh, last year. Uh, and it seeks to it seeks to solve uh, a curious problem, which I, I won't focus on today, but I'll just explain to you what my motivation is for diving into the archives of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, torture is a topic of public debate. Uh, there are those primarily in the policy realm who support the interrogation, uh, especially of terrorists arguing that it is an efficient way to obtain information quickly and accurately. Uh, there are some critics in the policy world. And then there are supporters and critics in the public realm, uh, both in America, in Britain, all around the world. Uh, there are those who think that uh, torture is justified and effective as an interrogation method, and those who uh, oppose it not just on moral grounds, but on efficiency grounds. In other words, I think there's broad agreement that torture is immoral. The question is, can one still engage in this immoral act uh, in order to say, save lives? The problem with this debate is that it is not based on facts or data because we have no facts and data. There's very, very little evidence about torture in the last 20 years by the US government, by the British government, by any other government, because governments are not happy to share details about their torture campaigns. Uh, and when they do share details, they lie, uh, usually uh, proudly declaring how very effective and very quick uh, their interrogation was. And the few times that you hear from torture victims, uh, you also receive information that's very, very one-sided. So whereas the government will say torture was successful, all the detainees gave us all the information we wanted, the victims will often say exactly the opposite. It was terrible. It was awful. We never said anything. It was a complete waste of time. Nor do we have any information about 20th century torture. There are no good archives of Gestapo torture, of Soviet torture, of French torture in Algeria, uh, of American torture in Vietnam. There are uh, plenty of stories. There are plenty of incidents, but there's no database. There's no significant and reliable source of information consistently across years that allows us to do some analysis. 
So to address that issue, I dove into the archives of the Spanish Inquisition, which, as many of you know, uh, lasted for three, perhaps even four centuries, depending on how you count, engaged in torture to a significant extent, although not as significant, I think, as most amateurs would believe. Uh, and the archives are plentiful and detailed. So I've, I've shared some numbers with you here uh, to show you how many files one could read if one wanted to. Um, now let me tell you a little about the files and the different shapes they take so that you see how I constructed the information for my book. I could not possibly read even 1% of the archives of the Spanish Inquisition. That would have been a very long and a very, very boring book. So I chose three kinds of data for my book. First of all, I uh, chose uh, cases of torture that happened very early on in the history of the Inquisition. Um, and that provided a moderate level of detail. So um, we have assembled, this is not my work, these are my scholarly predecessors, um, uh, all the relevant trials of, the, uh, of cases of heresy by the Spanish Inquisition in Ciudad Real between 1484 and 1515. Those are 124 trials. Uh, and in nine of these, torture is mentioned in some way. Either the person is tortured or the person is witness at a, at a uh, case in which torture is used, or the person mentions some other case of torture in the past. Um, it's important that the cases I look at not only be cases of torture, so I'm interested in who is tortured and who is not tortured, and what the differences are, both in cause and in effect. So why are some people tortured and others not? And what kind of people, what kind of information do people provide who are tortured compared to people who were not tortured? Because I'm trying to get in part at this question of, um, is torture a viable means of extracting truthful information. So that's one set of cases and it takes up one chapter in my book. These are the 124 trials from Ciudad Real. Um, perhaps some of you will ask me later on what the findings are. I don't, I'm not, I don't wanna go into the findings in, in too much detail. I'll, I'll flag for you that one thing that makes this period very interesting because it's very early in the history of the Inquisition is the Inquisition is still figuring out how to torture, when to torture, who to torture, and how to document these things. So one sees in the course of the 30 years I'm covering here, one sees a process of learning and improvement. Um, and here's a, a page from uh, one of those uh, trial documents. The average trial here is maybe 10 pages long. So it's sort of a medium level of detail meaning I can learn something about what the accused is accused of and what they said at the trial and who the witnesses were and whether torture was used and with what result, but I don't get a lot of auxiliary information that I think your group might be interested in. Family members, religious practices, cultural habits, um, descriptions of the city environment in which they lived, uh, economic information on how they made their living. The, the, the information is too sparse for that. But it does allow me to construct family trees. So here's a family tree I constructed using those, using those trials. Uh, you'll find this diagram in the book. Uh, I use it in part to show, uh, I hope that's clear enough on your screen. Some of these frames are bold. Some of these frames are particularly dark. Um, I can, in fact, uh, I think I can scribble with a pen if I try really hard. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, yeah, so, well, it's not very helpful, but here, this guy here, Juan de Fez, uh, Alfonso Martinez, Juan Falzon, uh, Maria Gonzalez, these three guys here uh, were all tortured, Catalina Gomez as well. Um, no, Juan de Fez is the only one here tortured. The others with the bold frame are trials that I was able to rely on. And you can see how I can correlate information from one document to the next. 
Uh, so Catalina testifies against Juan. Uh, Alonso testifies against Juan. Alonso uh, testifies against Juan. Uh, and, and just as the Inquisition correlated this information, uh, I, can, I can then correlate it as well. Um, the other thing I want to note is that I have information on people who, uh, who were not at the trial or people for whom trial documents are not available. They're mentioned in some way. They were present at some event, and so I can fit them into I can fit them into my family tree. Okay, let's shift back to mouse. Uh, oh, I don't quite know how I get rid of these scribbles here because now they're on the screen forever. Uh, I might have to stop share and not again. Here's another here's another diagram from. Um, from, from the same period, also from Ciudad Real. And again, in dark frame are people whose trial documents I have in my hand. Uh, Maria Gonzalez here is the only one who was tortured. And then all the others are mentioned, uh, are mentioned in passing. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second um, in the hope that when I share screen again, these scribbles will be gone because that's kind of annoying. Okay, can you see my full screen again? Yes. Great, so here's a second set of trials. These are from uh, later in uh, the history of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, these are trials from Toledo. You all know where Toledo is. Um, and here I have a much larger and much uh, sparser set of trials. These were not collected by me. These were collected by, uh, by Lee, whose name uh, you, you may have heard, the, the scholar of the Spanish Inquisition uh, from, uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, he uh, summarized them 100 years ago, which was very helpful to me. The actual manuscripts themselves uh, are held uh, in Germany, and um, I, was, I, was able to, I was able to obtain them uh, that way. Um, and as you see here, each of these paragraphs on screen is one trial. These are summaries of trials. So the detail here is really very, very, very sparse. Um, not enough, in fact, in order to establish family relations and genealogies. This is really just information on the accusation, whether torture happened, whether confession resulted, and what the punishments were. But it's a very, very large data set of 1,046 trials. Lots of cases of torture, lots of cases of non-torture, uh, and interesting comparisons between the two. So I can establish whether women were tortured more often than men, whether young people were tortured more often than old people, whether there were some crimes that were more likely to result in torture, where certain types of torture were more likely to yield confessions. Um, it's, it's quite a statistically uh, impressive database. Now let me talk about the, the set that I am uh, most interested in, which are uh, the trials from uh, Mexico City. Uh, so now, now I've moved my focus to the other side of the world, but my time period overlaps with the trials in uh, Toledo. So I can now uh, analyze and question how the methods of the Spanish Inquisition in Spain itself are different from the methods of the Spanish Inquisition in the Spanish colonies. Uh, here I have available to me some extremely detailed trial documents. Uh, not too many, a couple of dozen, but each one of these trial documents contains a wealth of detail. So at my own university, uh, there are several of these trial documents from Mexico City. This one is a very significant document. It's the trial of uh, Manuel de Lucena, uh, and it covers 1,500 pages. I think you can see in the image that it's extremely detailed. Uh, it's leather bound, and I spent many, many, many hours pouring through this trial document page after page after page after page. Uh, it's fascinating because Manuel de Lucena was one of the leaders of the Converso community uh, in uh, Mexico City in this period um, and was burned at the stake for his, uh, for his heresies. 
Uh, here is uh, the manuscript open, sort of uh, in the middle of the manuscript. The, the scribes inserted into the heart of the text a second document, which you can see here in Lucena's own handwriting. This is a letter that he tried to smuggle out of prison in which he uh, both um, um, references, cites, in fact, in full, uh, Psalms uh, from the book of Psalms and corresponds with his wife. Uh, and thus inadvertently reveals to the court all sorts of information about the Jewish community uh, in Mexico City. If you look carefully on this page, I'm sort of um, reluctant to annotate, but uh, I guess I can clear it after I'm done. So I can do that. Uh, here, let's try this. Uh, right here, if, if you have a sharp eye, uh, you can see the words La Ley de Moisen. Uh, he's being he's being accused and he's con uh, accusing others of uh, of following the laws of Moses. Um, but the, the document itself is, is fascinating in all sorts of ways, and I, I can tell you much more about it later on. Um, this it gives you some indication of the kinds of levels of detail that you have in these documents while we're trying to guess who the CIA tortured and how they tortured them and with what results. Here we have scribes actually sitting in the torture chamber, recording every word said by the victims of torture, uh, which I find uh, extremely shocking, very moving, uh, sad, actually really very sad. Um, and it provides a tremendous amount of information. It provided a tremendous amount of information to the Inquisition, and it provides a tremendous amount of information to us, not just about the so-called heresies, but about life in that period, about uh, relationships between people, about how they cook and what they eat, the clothes they wear. Um, in fact, there's enough information in these uh, trial manuscripts to uh, sketch out the diagram of the town and figure out who lived where, who had illicit relationships with whom, who led the prayer services, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, a lot of information about religious practices. Conveniently, and maybe I'm telling you something here you all already know, each one of these massive trial documents, and they can really run in the hundreds and thousands of pages, uh, has a, a helpful cover page, which uh, the scribes create when the document is done. So maybe I should take a step back and say, at the heart of these documents, these, these massive tomes like this, is the interrogation of the accused multiple appearances in court, multiple interrogations, sometimes torture, usually not. Uh, and then all the witnesses who appear either to accuse the accused or to defend the accused. That is at the core of the manuscript, but appended to the core of the manuscript are copies, of course, hand copies of all other trials with any information relevant to this trial. So every time a trial ends, dozens of scribes copy the trial word for word and append those copies to all other trials to which those pages might be relevant. So in other words, if this is the trial of Manuel de Lucena, it includes not just the words he spoke and the words the witnesses spoke. It includes every other trial in Mexico City in which Manuel de Lucena or his family members are mentioned. And that's how you get 1,500 page tome. It's not just one trial, but it's copies of multiple trials. And then a very helpful cover page appended by the scribe with the names of key figures and the page on which you can find them. So you can see here, and now I know how to draw so I can very easily draw. So you're reading the trial of Manuel de Lucena, or in case, this case, you're reading the trial of Isabel de Carvajal. And you're interested in learning more about Luis de Carvajal, who's, of course, a very significant character. Well, you can find information about him on page 332, 333, 335, 339, 349, 350, and 359. And if you uh, want to read uh, about uh, Dona Mariana, who is Luis's sister, you can read about her on these pages. 
And if you want to read about Antonio Diaz de Caceres, you can read about him on this page. Um, these indexes themselves run for many, many, many pages at the beginning of the document. They make it very, very easy to see who's involved and who's connected in these trials. Okay. And of course, they allow me to build family trees. This family tree is not particularly revolutionary. You'll find it in any book about Luis de Carvajal. Um, this family tree is more interesting because uh, this is the family tree of Manuel de Lucena, who was Luis de Carvajal's closest friend. And they led the, this underground Jewish community in Mexico in that period together. Um, in the many books written about Luis de Carvajal, uh, Manuel is mentioned, but the trial manuscript that reveals all this information is not mentioned because it was considered lost. It had disappeared from the Mexican archives, had made its way, God knows how, through the black market, eventually to an antiquarian fair in Los Angeles, where a Berkeley archivist discovered it, and with permission from the Mexican archives, bought it and brought it to Berkeley. And so in many of the books I'm sure you have read about the, uh, the community in, in Mexico City, uh, the, the, the trial of Manuel de Lucena is considered missing. Well, I have it, and I've, I've read it in detail. It's, it's sitting uh, a few steps outside my office, and it's an absolutely, it's an absolutely fascinating text. And uh, overturns much of what we thought about um, Luis de Carvajal. In the standard account, Luis leads the Jewish community and then under torture betrays the Jewish community. Uh, and that's only partially true. It is true that he, under torture, revealed the names of 121 other Jews in that community. But what I now know, and what was not previously known, is that Manuel de Lucena had already shared those names with the Spanish Inquisition. In other words, the torture of Luis did not reveal new information. It confirmed existing information. And that's exactly how the Inquisition used torture. It did not use torture like the CIA, to reveal exciting new information. It used torture to confirm old information of which it was unsure, or um, in cases in which it wanted um, complete and full confessions. Uh, so that's the role that the torture of Luis de Carvajal performed. Uh, Luis did not teach the Spanish Inquisition anything that the Spanish Inquisition did not already know. Uh, here are some images, uh, uh, of course, not from the period in which the tortures happen. These are images uh, drawn up much later. They're partially imaginary images, although they're, they're, they're inspired by the text itself. And uh, they show the torture of uh, Luis's sister, uh, both her trial and her torture. I'd like to call your attention to the fact, and again, I'm going to draw on my own slides here. Uh, that in uh, both the trial, there's a scribe sitting right here. And here he is in the torture chamber as well, writing down every word that is said. And those are the documents that we have before us. Uh, and they reveal a tremendous amount of information. I'll let you read this. And this goes on for page after page after page after page. Uh, this is a more personal passage, but there are other passages in which he simply describes what they ate for Passover who led the prayer, who was in attendance, what people wore, who came in at what hour, uh, who left together with whom, um, but also information about uh, trade relations, uh, information about education, uh, information about conversion, who teaches who, 
Um, who uh, slaughters the, the kosher meat uh, for the community? Uh, where are the sacred texts hidden? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here's a very signif significant page from this uh, Manuel de Lucena document, this 1500 page document. This is the moment at which uh, Manuel confirms his condemnation of the Carvajal family. Here they are listed in order. Luis, um, I see there's Dona Isabel, there's Dona Leonor, there's Dona Mariana. Um, the first one must be Dona Francisca, who's the mother, um, and uh, Dona Mariana, all listed in order. And then here at the very bottom of the page uh, is uh, the signature of, uh, I've lost my cursor, uh, the signature, no, not here, here, the signature of Lucena uh, himself uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, so this is the this is the moment that seals the fate of uh, the Carvajal family and all the people here, including Manuel, uh, end up burning uh, burning at the stake uh, at, after the Auto de Fe. Uh, here's an even uh, more significant moment, at least uh, in my mind. Uh, Manuel de Lucena is asked by the tribunal to recite the Shema prayer, and so he stands in front of the tribunal. And he speaks these words. Uh, they're not quite the Shema prayer. They're a, sort of a garbled version of the Shema prayer, uh, either because the scribe who wrote the words down did not speak Hebrew, which is likely that he did not speak Hebrew, or equally plausible, uh, that Manuel did not know the prayer well. This is now a community that has lived for over 150 years without rabbis, without, uh, without a cheder, without a, an official place to study Judaism. And so members of the community are learning prayers and practices and rituals uh, sort of by, by word of mouth. Um, and, and I can imagine that these, these prayers become, become corrupted over time. Uh, so you can still see some semblance of the, of the Shema prayer there, uh, but you can also see it sort of uh, gradually disintegrating. Uh, the, the notion that uh, Lucena is, is standing in front of the tribunal, ask, being asked to sort of both recite and perform the prayer, because he's also showing them how he stands and how he closes his eyes and how he puts one hand on his heart and when exactly he's supposed to bow. So he's just really teaching them how to recognize Jewish prayer. And then uh, a month after that, he is. Uh, he is burned at the stake. Um, le less of interest to you and, and more of interest to my line of research. I can correlate these different trials. I can sort them chronologically and figure out who appeared before the court and when. And I can then try to figure out who is tortured and who's not tortured in this little chart here, which does not present the full data from Mexico. This is just a dozen trials that I've chosen sort of uh, almost at random. Um, I designated in bold the cases in which torture was used. There are these cases down here. These are the cases of torture. And you immediately notice as you look down the chronological list that the people who are tortured are tortured last. Torture happens at the end of a series of trials. Again, because it's not designed to reveal new information. It's designed to summarize a trial and confirm information. And you'll also notice that the people who they testify against, so Violante testifies here against Manuel, against Manuel, and here she testifies against Beatriz Enriquez, and here she testifies against Catalina Enriquez. But these are all people who have already spoken to the court. There's nothing new here. And similarly, Luis de Carvajal, who's tortured towards the very, very end, he accuses all these people, but these are all people who have already appeared. Confirming in my mind that the purpose of torture um, is, is not to reveal new information. The, the Inquisition did not trust torture to reveal new information. The Inquisition trusted torture sometimes under very limited conditions. Once it had gathered all the data, if there was a participant who was very clearly guilty, 
because there was overwhelming evidence against them. And you can see in the case of Luis de Carvajal uh, that there is, uh, you would see it here, there's already a long line of accusers. Manuel has accused him. Catalina has accused him. Uh, his sister Leonor has accused him. Uh, there is overwhelming evidence against the individual, yet they are refusing to collaborate. At that moment, torture is used, but there is not a single case in my entire book of a person being executed on the basis of torture alone. It's always a confirmation between torture and non-torture interrogation. So the Inquisition is very skeptical about torture, and it uses torture rarely and carefully. Uh, so that's the last thing I wanted to say. It's, it, it was not an easy book to write. Um, it's a very difficult period to read about. The information is not uh, at a distant and abstract, but very visceral, very moving. Uh, it's the stuff of nightmares uh, to some extent, because that entire community is eradicated and is eradicated uh, rather thoroughly. The only people who escape the Inquisition are, uh, are people who flee. Um, and, uh, and their lives are sad. These documents, however, shed uh, light on all aspects of their lives before they fall into the hands of the Inquisition. And so we have authors like Gitlitz uh, and, and Cohen and many others who are able to draw out of these manuscripts information about Jewish culture, Jewish life, Jewish habits, family relations, uh, all sorts of all sorts of wonderful information that really um, sheds sheds a fascinating uh, light on the period. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop my sharing here, and uh, I've spoken for half an hour. I would love to uh, hear some of your uh, questions. Great, thank 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 you very much. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, a first first question is. What was the Inquisition's goal? Are they principally interested in ferreting out information or in saving souls? Excellent question. It gets right to the heart of the matter. Uh, let me start by saying what the Inquisition was not interested in, because the answer to your question, David, is both. Okay. They believed that by getting full and accurate information, a, a confession, a religious confession, but the confession has to be full and complete and truthful, only then could they save your soul. Uh, but that has to be distinguished, and this is a common misconception, from something the Inquisition was not interested in. The Inquisition was not interested in uh, declarations of faith. The Inquisition was not interested in getting someone to say what they believed. Uh, you know, confess, confess that you are actually Jewish. Um, most of the information they collect is empirical and falsifiable information um, that can be confirmed. Names of people, places, habits, uh, leadership structures, you know, recipes, meeting places. So no inquisitor in any document I've ever come across has asked a, uh, an accused to uh, share the religious beliefs they are utterly disinterested in beliefs. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Moses? They never ask. They never even ask, do you believe in the Jewish faith? The formulation is, do you follow the law of Moses, which is a question about things you do, not about things you believe. Do you fast during Lent? Do you eat pork? Do you attend Yom Kippur services? Um, they're collecting that information in order to get at other community members, and they want to get at all community members because they want to expose heresy, um, and, and they want to do that in order to save souls. But th the word confession, to some extent, is a very misleading word. They are not interested in religious confessions. They're interested in collaboration and information. And once they have all that collaboration and information, and once you've told them all the bad things you did, not the bad things you believed, because that, of course, is unverifiable, but all the bad things you did, then you can, uh, at the auto de fe, be 
either purged of your sins or or punished or burned uh, or excommunicated. So I hope that answers your question, David. Yeah, in a way, that's quite Jewish. It's about what you did rather than what you believe. Correct. It's Jewish and it's Catholic. Uh, okay. It is not Protestant. <laughs> okay, interesting. Right. right? Uh, so they're, they're yes, they're they're interested in religious yeah. practices. It's exactly right. You. Um... You, you, you were saying that the traditions were passed down within a community. Are you, are you sure that's the case and that not that sort of somebody might have sort of pitched up from Italy or somewhere else with Jewish knowledge? Because I think in the later, in the, the Mexico City trials in the 1620s, there was, you know, people who had come from outside there. Makes a lot of sense. Because by 1620, this community that I'm talking about was decimated, yeah, and its leaders were gone. Uh, there were there were 120 people involved in these trials. That's probably everybody in the Jewish community who then either fled or was exiled or was killed. Mm-hmm. Um, we know from these very first arrivals. Remember that Luis de Carvajal was essentially um, on the first boat. Uh, that uh, that arrived in Leon together with his uncle, the conquistador. Um, so these were some of the very, very first Jews in the New World. Luis de Carvajal is also famous for being the very first Jewish author in the New World. His writings, which we have in his original handwriting, are the first Jewish sacred texts written in the New World. So there weren't many people to teach them. Uh, Luis... Uh, says that he learned his Judaism from his stepmother, or rather his step-aunt, the wife of the conquistador. Uh, Manuel de Lucena mentions the names of the old Spaniards who taught him this prayer and that prayer, uh, but they did not come with any uh, religious leaders of their own at the time. Luis was the leader. Manuel was the leader. So they re- recreated, I think, the rituals as best they could, uh, and you, but you can see in the Shema prayer that this is, you know, this is sort of getting uh, that this 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 gets corrupted over time. I, I I gather you're right, David, that once this community was eradicated, the next wave, especially if it did not come from Spain, where there were really no official Jewish communities at that point for well over a hundred years, but if people joined to the New World from Italy or from the Netherlands or uh, from Turkey, uh, they might have come with, with actual uh, religious teachers and, and with books. Thank you. Um, so one, one last question for me. In your first slide, when you were showing the uh, percentages of, of torture, it was uh, noticeably higher in, in Valencia. Is that for some sort of, because there were lots of Muslims there and they treated them more roughly or? It's a particular reason. Uh, it could be. It could also be. So let me look at that slide for a second there, because you're asking an excellent question. Um, um, so Valencia, I see here on the slide, is... Uh, is 22. Uh, um, yeah, but it, it starts earlier and it stretches later. Let me actually share that slide so everybody can see what we're talking about. Um, here we go. That's there and that's there. Uh, I have to go all the way back. Do I? Yes, I do have to go all the way back. Well, that doesn't take too long. (laughs) Here it is. Here are the numbers. So uh, I don't think, David, it's because the Valencia Inquisition is one of the first and starts in 1478. I think it's because it's one of the last. And as the Inquisition reaches the 18th and the 19th century, it's just really, really hard to find heretics. They've all left or they've all been killed. And at that point, torture becomes more common. So as a rule, the Inquisition tortures more over time. It is really quite reluctant to torture in the beginning, 10%, 20% uh, in the beginning. And then the numbers start going up and up and up as there are fewer voluntary witnesses and fewer other Jews who you can torture to find other Jews, um, you uh, you resort to more extreme methods and with lower rates of success. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. 
I do find this a fascinating presentation. And, Thank you. Um, you must be aware of the work of Benjamin Netanyahu, the origins of the Inquisition in 15th century Spain. Ben Sion, yeah, no, so not, yeah, it's not Benjamin, but it's it's Benjamin's oh, father. Yes, ben Benjamin's father. Yeah. yeah. Ben Sion, yes. Yes. Um, he says that um, the, the, the use of torture makes all of these confessions between brackets um, untrustworthy. And you can say nothing about whether someone was uh, Jewish or not. Do you agree to that? No, I don't. I don't. And it's very, very easy. Once you have in front of you, um, uh, you know, in the case of Mexico, 30, 40, 50 trial documents, um, and you start comparing them one to the other, uh, it, it very the truth very quickly emerges, right? Um, uh, and remember that of those fifty people, uh, only only a handful are tortured, mm -hmm. only three or four. So even if we disregard the three or four that were tortured, we still have a mass of documents, including in uh, Luis's own handwriting, including Manuel de Lucena's letter to his own wife, uh, that very, very clearly indicate not just that they were Jewish, but how they were Jewish and how they prayed and what they believed in and what kind of Bible they read and what food they were willing to eat and not willing to eat. Um, and then in the next stage, I do exactly what the Inquisition does. I compare these non-torture files with the torture files, and I get exactly the same information. Uh, and the Inquisition was very worried about this. The Inquisition was, of course, worried that people would lie under torture. Uh, and, and they were very skeptical about torture, which is why they very often rejected confessions made under torture, unless they could find the same information in other sources. And in most cases, you do find the same information in other sources. So I have one example uh, in my book, which I'm now not going to cite in detail, but I'll give you the, the, the general idea. On and around, I want to say, 1598, there is a Yom Kippur service in Mexico City that uh, Manuel de Lucena and his wife attend. And um, uh, Manuel talks about it. Now, Manuel is not tortured. Maybe I should have mentioned that, that this entire 1,500-page manuscript, Manuel himself is not tortured. He describes the Yom Kippur service, and he describes the 10 people who were there with him. A was there, and B was there, and C was there, and D was there, and E was there, and here's what we did, and here's when we met, and here's the hour at which we left, and then we met again the next day. But I also have the trial documents of all these other people. And each one of them tells me that they were at Yom Kippur with Manuel de Lucena in this house together with A and C and D and E and F. And then I have the trial document of Mr. F, who tells me that I was there with A and B and C and D and E. And so, of course, when it comes to the trial of G, who everybody else claims was in the room on Yom Kippur and who says, I'm not Jewish, I was never there. Well, of course, the Inquisition tortures him. And then when he says under torture, yes, yes, okay, fine, I admit. I was there on Yom Kippur with A, B, C, D, E, F. I know that his, I know that his confession is true. I just have to compare it to the other cases. Um, so uh, so that's, I think that's one reason why I have tremendous confidence in these documents. I, there's two more reasons why I have confidence in the documents. The first is the documents were not written for us. They were not written for Uton. They were not written for Netanyahu. They were not written for me. The goal there is not to lie to us or convince us of anything. These are the documents that Spanish bureaucrats wrote for other Spanish bureaucrats. There was absolutely no incentive for them to lie to one another. They were simply recording what they heard. I don't think they ever expected that 300 years later, we would be reading through these documents. And they were not ashamed of torturing people. It was an entirely standard practice. The second big reason why I believe much of what's written, not everything, but much of what's written in these documents is that the documents themselves attest to failures of torture. 
So for example, looking at the documents from Toledo, this is this massive database of a thousand plus trials, I find uh, 20, uh, 20%, 30% success rate in torture. 30% of torture cases yield information. But 30% of torture that yields information means 70% of torture that fails to produce information. Mm -hmm. How do I know that 70% of torture failed to produce information? Because the Inquisition tells me. In 70% of the cases, we tortured and we got nothing. Now, why would they tell me that? If you're going to pretend that torture is extremely successful, why would you claim that it only works in 30% of the cases? Why not 50% of the cases? Why not 80% of the cases? So the Inquisition is very honest with its own bureaucrats about dead-end investigations, about people who lied, about torture that yielded nothing, about people who were arrested in vain. These are all internal documents, and they and, and it's not as if the Inquisition pretends that everything's working spectacularly well, and they always uncover the truth, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're, they're very, very honest about cases of failure. Uh, they also talk back and forth with their headquarters in Madrid about how to interrogate better. So the, the, the high inquisitioner will write back to the inquisition in Mexico and say, you need to do more of this and do a little bit less of that as they're trying to improve their methods. Uh, so the documents are really, are really quite transparent. Uh, I disagree strongly with uh, Netanyahu on this issue. Uh, the other thing that I um, gather from your talk is that the Inquisition learned about Judaism from their prisoners. Did they not have that knowledge before? Correct. So in the beginning, they had very little knowledge. Uh, and you can see that they're asking some strange questions. Uh, it takes them a very long time to figure out what is and is not a Jewish practice. And eventually they uncover each and every little detail. And so they become, towards the end, interested in people who wash their clothes on Friday afternoons. They're interested in people who eat garbanzo beans in the month of Tishrei. They're interested in um, people who read particular versions of Christian Bibles that are around, but skip some chapters, but not others. They become real experts in Judaism. Uh, and I think that's why they are so interested in having Manuel de Lucena pray for them so that they can really pay attention to all the nuances, how he stands, how he speaks, how he moves his head, how he sings. Um, Yes, they're, they're learning over time. In the beginning, they're very clumsy. They're very, very clumsy. And they, uh, early on in the, in the 1490s, um, uh, uh, torture, you know, they believe witnesses who they shouldn't believe. They torture people who they shouldn't torture. They, they learn over time how to correct these things. Um, one other thing that I take away from you is that uh, this generation of Liz de Caravelle um, was extinguished by the Inquisition. Does that mean that there was no more um, converso community in Mexico? Uh, it's very hard to tell. The leadership was extinguished. Mm -hmm. In other words, as I correlate these various trials with each other, and again, imagine I have two dozen, three dozen, so maybe you know, uh, 30, 40 trials, each is a thousand pages long, just a wealth of information. And as I start comparing these to one another, eventually I have a full roster of every Jew mentioned by every other Jew in Mexico City in this period. It's a very long list of names. And the Inquisition gets hold of almost all of them. Certainly it gets hold of the leaders. Uh, exceptions are people who escape early on and flee. Mm -hmm. Um, and some less significant characters who uh, are, are not at the heart of the story. You know, they maybe they participated, somebody, some, somebody accuses them of having participated in some Passover ceremony five years ago. They're never heard of again. I don't know if they're alive or dead. Um, I don't know how many family members they have. 
So it, it, I think it's likely that someone survived, um, but the heart of the community, the big players, uh, were all gone. I should note that this happened in two rounds. There was an early round in the 1590s when many were tried, uh, some were tortured, not many, um, but, but the big leaders escaped or escaped with a warning. And then several years passed, Luis and his family members promised that they would not go back to their old Jewish ways. They, they formally denounced Judaism. They formally joined the Christian community. They were in house arrest, but while they were in house arrest, they continued their Jewish practices. And so then in 1603 came a second round of trials interrogations. And at that point in the intervening years, the Inquisition had gathered a ton of information. And at that point, the net closed and nobody was able to escape. Possibly some, some marginal fingers, figures, uh, you know, some aunt or, or a distant cousin. Uh, even Luisa's little sister, Annika, who at the beginning of this whole affair was, uh, I believe, 12 years old um, and escaped all of these trials, uh, appeared at an auto de fe 30 years later. And that's the very last image I showed. 30 years later, the Inquisition caught up with her. Uh, and she was she was burned at the stake, uh, garroted and burned at the stake. So I, I certainly know of no Carvajal or Lucena family member who survived. One last question for me, and then we know, go to our public. What conclusions do you draw for our own times about torture? So that's a very dangerous question because uh, the CIA is not the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the CIA also doesn't want to be the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition tortures under very unique conditions. It's an authoritarian regime. It's full cooperation between the intelligence machinery, which is the Spanish Inquisition, and the regime, the government, the, 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 the monarchy. Limitless resources. Uh, and very important, limitless time. There's no rush. The Inquisition is happy to return to the same town in Spain or Mexico or Peru 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, over and over and over again, and interrogate the same people 17 times. So this is very different from torturing terrorists. Very, very different. And yet, and here I'm making sort of an a fortiori argument, even the Inquisition, with all its money and all its time and full control over society so that each member of society could be tortured. They didn't only torture uh, the most important suspects. They tortured young and old, sick and healthy, women and men from all walks of society. Even the Inquisition under those conditions did not trust torture. It used torture hesitatingly, you know, 10 to 20%, depending on your point of view, is, is either a lot of torture or very little torture. It's a lot less torture than civil courts in the same period. The torture was much more limited. The torture was more cautious than the kind of torture that you would have experienced in the Tower of London in the same time. And the torture only happened at the very end of a trial in order to confirm existing information, never in order to extract new information. It also only happened after the uh, people tortured had been interrogated by other means, usually for years, years, not weeks or months, but years. Uh, Luis de Carvajal sat in prison for two years before he was tortured. So this is very different from grabbing a suspect in Afghanistan and in the first 48 hours trying to get information from them. Uh, and I'll note a last difference which is the Inquisition tortured about past actions. What did you do? Who did, who did you meet? The CIA and other intelligence agencies torture about future intentions. Who do you intend to attack? Where do you intend to bomb? Which of course is much more difficult, right? I, I think it's easier to get information about something that happened as opposed to something that hasn't happened. So in all these senses, I think the comparison is dangerous and one has to do it very carefully, 
I focus on that in the first and last chapter of the book. Um, but if there is any comparison to be had here, it is, uh, I'll summarize with good news and bad news, depending on your point of view. The idea that torture does not work is wrong. Torture definitely works. Torture yields information and it yields accurate information. There's no question about that. Um, even if it only does so in 30% of the cases, that's, that's a very, very significant result. But uh, it takes a long time uh, and it takes a form of control and funding uh, that only the Inquisition could have had and that current intelligence agencies certainly don't have. So it's a dangerous metaphor. Mm -hmm. Point taken. Uh, Boos Kahan in the chat had an interesting question. Um, why would the authorities want to keep such detailed records of Inquisition trials? Would they intend, uh, intend that such records serve to legitimate the inevitable <laughs> outcomes of guilt? Uh, they kept detailed records because they wanted to compare cases to one another and learn something from the comparison. Uh, so, so the uh, level of detail allows them uh, to see exactly who meets whom and when, uh, who the leaders are, uh, who the followers are. Um, it's, it's, it's done for purposes of, of corroboration. And of course, there's no shame attached to the act of torture itself. There's no reason to hide these documents. Um, and I'd, I'd say the last, the last point is that this detailed confession fulfills a religious purpose, right? For the saving of souls, you need a full and detailed confession of all the sins. Everybody you prayed with, everybody who you tried to convert, everybody who you discussed Judaism with, everybody who, with whom you ate during Lent, or refuse to eat during Yom Kippur. Um, so, so the Inquisition insists again and again that they want full and complete information. Bruce, you had some other questions. Do you wish to? Yeah, can I go through them real quick, Tom? Thank you. Thanks, Professor Hasner, and greetings from Stanford. Um, <laughs> hello, hello. Um, come by, yeah. Um, Listen, uh, I am fascinated by the work you, you've done. How often did innocence, as opposed to guilt, get a, uh, get uh, ascribed to the uh, defendant? Oh, uh, very often. Very often. Um, and that's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'll say a couple of things, Bruce, that I think you'll find you'll find as interesting as I did. That first of all, there is no relationship between guilt and innocent torture and punishment. You can be tortured because you withheld information. That doesn't mean that you yourself are guilty. And that doesn't mean that you will be punished in any way. Similarly, you can be not tortured and be found guilty and be punished. Uh, and so it's very clear to me that torture is not used as a form of punishment. Torture is a means to extract information. And if under torture, you reveal nothing, you are assumed to be innocent. And you will then be set free with no penalties attached. Go home. God be with you. So it's almost um, a trial by fire. It is, in a sense, a trial by fire. This is one way in which these torture methods are not rational. In many other ways, I think they are rational. Um, uh, in many, many times, people do confess under torture, but their confession doesn't line up with what other people are saying. And then they are punished for lying under torture, not for the sins they committed, but Got for it. not being truthful with the Inquisition. Perjury. So these are completely Perjury. separate categories. And the Inquisition, as I said, openly admits that in 70% of the cases, the people they tortured did not provide information and were sent home. Well, one quick question as a Jewish lawyer, how good were the defense lawyers? Did they get <laughs> defense just... lawyers? They did what get kind, defense lawyers. It's very interesting. You processed it, rights did they? Yeah. They had yeah, yeah. So that's very, reports. very interesting. I think the most, so some of the defense lawyers were uh, not good at all. Uh, I'm sure they were scared. Did, did that get better over time or worse over time? 
Uh, you know, I don't know enough to say, but I know there's research out there on this. It was not the focus of my analysis. Got it. Um, but uh, so some of them were very, very good. Uh, one aspect of the, these trial procedures that I found absolutely fascinating was this idea of tachas. So tachas were lists of people who, if you were accused and you were arrested, you could provide the lists of people who you deemed untrustworthy and who you suspected had a grudge against you. And so you could tell the court ahead of time, look, I don't know who else you're interrogating because uh, I am not allowed to be witness while you're interrogating uh, my, um, my, my the witnesses either uh, of, of, the, uh, of the defense or, or of the accusation. I'm not in the room. But I'll just have you know that I have this neighbor across the street who is extremely jealous of my wife, and anything she tells you is a lie. And the court took these accusations very, very seriously um, and, and weighed them against, uh, against the claims made by various witnesses. Uh, so it wasn't, of course, a 21st century democratic liberal trial. Uh, as I said, the, the accused was not himself or herself present while all these other witnesses were talking, they did not know who was witnessing for them or against them. Um, they did not know what they were being accused of. This is also very interesting. So it was the Inquisition arrested you and star, told you... Star chamber, very star chamber. The Inquisition arrested you and told you that you were accused of heresy, period. And now, confess. Uh, this is an interesting point because many who criticize torture under the Spanish Inquisition will say, well, of course, the torture just said what they knew the Inquisition wanted to hear. But they didn't know what the Inquisition wanted to hear. They knew nothing. They didn't know who was accusing them. They don't know what they were being accused of. They didn't know who else was being interrogated. And so odds are that anything they said could be used against them. Uh, and their incentive was to say very, very little. Um, often people incriminated themselves by providing much more information than the Inquisition already had. And so torture wasn't often necessary. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Professor. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Bernard Miller has his hand up. Uh, Bernard. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very, very interesting and really frightening presentation um, and for all the work that you've put into it. And I have a two part question, which you've sort of led up to in your last answer. Um, the first part was, um, as I understand it, a lot of the cases in the Inquisition were based on denunciation. And very often the people doing the denouncing were the people you've just described, somebody who had a grudge, servants who had a grudge, business partners who thought they might gain financial or business advantage and so on. And um, I wondered, you, you've been nodding, so I'm guessing that your reading of the documents corroborates that. But the second part of the question is, did the denouncers or the witnesses ever get tortured because they were, okay, perhaps you could talk. Absolutely. No, no, you've got it absolutely right. So, so you, you've, heard, you've heard Monty Python say often, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. But of yeah. course, everybody expected the Spanish Inquisition because uh, about a month before these trials started, a period of grace, that was the term, the period of grace uh, was declared in the city center or in the village center. And that was the period at which witnesses were encouraged to come forward with no penalties attached in order to provide voluntary information to the Inquisition. And sometimes this period of grace was extended to another month because so many witnesses came forward that the Inquisition simply couldn't handle the paperwork. The genius of this period of grace was that the Inquisition headquarters were always in the center of town, meaning everybody could see who came forward as witness. And if you had three business partners, Bernard, and three of them came forward during the period of grace, you better, you better show up at the Inquisition headquarters and provide some voluntary information of your own. 
So it was really a, a, an evil genius of a mechanism to draw people in. And the Inquisition treated all of this with tremendous skepticism. It sometimes tortured people because their denunciations did not line up with the denunciations of others. So a fascinating series of cases from Ciudad Real, which I document in the book, has to do with the town drunkard. Uh, she's a famous gossip. Everybody knows that she's an alcoholic. She comes in, she accuses half of the women in Ciudad Real, but her accusations don't line up because then these women are brought in and, uh, and they were at, at the wrong place in the wrong time and they don't even know one another and, and everything she says sort of doesn't line up. So she is then brought in and is tortured, but under torture, she, um, she, she sticks to her story. And so a couple of weeks, they gather more information. A couple of weeks later, they torture her a second time, at which point she clarifies that her confession under first torture was a false confession. Um, so all sorts of interesting things about this. First of all, the Inquisition understands how terribly fallible torture is as a method of extracting information. But second, the Inquisition is willing to use torture in order to shed light on false information gathered under torture. Um, if you and I, Bernard, together looked at all these files from Ciudad Real, you and I had, would have reached exactly the same conclusion, that this Maria Gonzalez, famous village drunk, is lying out of her teeth. That, that her statements just don't line up. Um, we, you and I now have the same information available to us that the Inquisition had, and it's sort of patently obvious as you correlate these cases. Um, and she, she, she then explains that she was terribly jealous of the other women in the village uh, with, their, you know, with their wealthy husbands who always made fun of her, uh, and that she, that she accused them because, uh, because of jealousy. So, so yes, collaborators do come forward. The Inquisition treats them with tremendous suspicion. It's only as patterns start to emerge and they hear the same story over and over and over again that they uh, then take accusations seriously. Remember also, Bernard, that they have material evidence that they can gather. They can search people's houses to see whether they have books in Hebrew. They can search people's kitchens to see whether they cook pork. They can uh, interrogate neighbors and ask, you know, what, what have you seen across the street on Friday night? Um, so it's, it's not just word of mouth. They're also gathering, they're, they are opening tombs to see how people were buried, whether they were buried according to Christian rites or Muslim rites or Jewish rites. So they're also comparing um, material evidence. You, you had a follow-up? Yeah, it, it was, um, again, on the denunciation issue, were there rewards um, did people get compensated for either denouncing or bearing witness? Uh, the, the reward was, yes, you could get compensation. You could become a friend of the court. Uh, and then you might even get a salary uh, for, for providing good services. Uh, I think the main reason why people came before the court was because in the period of grace, as the name suggests, you could admit to heresy and uh, meet with lenience. But of course you had to admit to heresy fully and completely. You couldn't just admit to your own heresy. You had to admit to the heresy of the people who were heretics with you. You couldn't just say, you know, I, I, I admit I was part of a minion last Friday. Well, okay, who are the other nine people? Um, otherwise, otherwise no leniency. I think that was the main motivator. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what, what percentage of, of those who were tortured, what, what percentage were accused of uh, Judaizing? Uh, and, and also, were they using the same strategy? Uh, or I, I don't know if you sort of looked at sort of Protestants and other groups, if, if they were using the same approach on, uh, on, on other groups as well. Right. So the trials from, the trials from Toledo allow me... Uh, to, uh, to run some statistics. I'm not going to open the chart because I, I don't, if, if you're very interested, you'll find the chart in the book um, uh, where I am able to compare across 15 different categories of accusation. So uh, to clarify, first of all, torture only happens in cases of heresy. So you cannot be tortured for bigamy. 
You cannot be tortured for uh, pretending to be a priest. You cannot be tortured for uh, fornication, which are all things the Inquisition was interested in, but was not allowed to use torture for. Was only allowed to use torture against Lutherans, meaning non-Catholic Christians, Muslims, Jews, and on a rare occasion, uh, witches, although that was, the, I think that was quite rare. Um, and, um, and, and, and then they used torture across these categories in, in more or less even numbers. It varies from time to time and from location to location. Uh, it, again, because there's no policy that says you must torture X number of people. It's a question of how many witnesses do I have available? So I don't need to torture anybody. And how many members of the community are recalcitrant? In other words, <laughs> I know the five of you were in the same room together praying. Four are collaborating. The fifth one won't speak. And that's when torture kicks in. Uh, so I, if I remember correctly, in, in Toledo, in the period I was looking at, slightly higher number of torture for uh, those accused of Muslim practices, but there were also fewer Muslims. So, so you know, the, the, these are not robust statistics. If, if I was just to be accused by somebody of making a heretical proposition, so essentially it's their word against mine, in Correct. that case, would, would one be tortured or not? No. No. Again, you're not tortured for the things you did. You're tortured for your failure to provide information. Torture is a means of extracting information. Torture is not a penalty. There, are, there is a whole series of gruesome penalties at the end of the trial after the auto da fe. Yeah. You can be whipped. You can be sent to the royal galleys. You can be exiled. Uh, you can uh, be forced to wear a San Benito, a sort of humiliating um, uh, form of, of, of dress. Uh, your name might be published in, in all sorts of ways. Torture happens during the trial, and you are never tortured because of something you did. You are only tortured because you withheld information. So now, if two, three, four people say that you made some statement in public, independently of one another, and their confessions line up, and you admit that you were there but you claim that you didn't say what you said, then you might be tortured. Then you might. So I'll, to give you an example from the trials in Ciudad Real, there's a case of a Protestant who was tortured because he foolishly made his Protestant grandstanding statements uh, during a carriage ride to Ciudad Real. And the people witnessing against him were the other people who sat in the carriage. And, and everybody agreed that they were in the carriage and he was in the carriage with them. Uh, and so it was very, very plain and obvious that they had all indeed met. And there was very good reason to assume that he had said what he said. Um, and, uh, and because he didn't collaborate, he was tortured. Um, so, so again, torture, not because of what you did, and certainly not because of the severity of what you did, but torture because of information you withheld. And it can be information about a tiny little thing. So it doesn't matter, David, whether the information withheld has to do with who the rabbi of the community is or whether it's which page of the book you were reading. That doesn't matter. It's just a question of withholding information. Thank you. Um, and, and, and Bruce is, is, is making quite a good point that the, the Inquisition uh, essentially lived off of what they could uh, confiscate. Um, was, was there a motive that they're for in, in, in going after richer richer merchants rather than just not you know some some have argued that i don't see that as a consistent pattern mostly yes it is true that the inquisition was self-financing um because it kept people in, under arrest for months and years and so people essentially had to feed themselves while they were in prison uh the the, the hard question to answer is when the court declared a penalty of confiscation of goods at the end of a trial, was that motivated by avarice? Or does that line up with people who were actually guilty? And I haven't studied that, so I don't know. Um, but, but in my mind, it's shocking enough that if, if, David, if you were arrested by the Inquisition and thrown into a solitary, uh, solitary cell for two years, 
Uh, you relied for food, for candles, for clothing, for soap on your own family. Uh, the Inquisition did not pay for your time in prison. And so conditions in prison varied uh, dramatically. But what happened with confiscation of goods at the end of a trial, that, that I can't speak to. Um, my general hunch is that as the Inquisition entered its third and fourth century, there were fewer and fewer people around uh, who were really heretics. And the Inquisition became sort of a bloated bureaucracy that very much uh, uh, was very much motivated by power and avarice. I, I don't think that was true early on. I think early on, you see a real concern with preserving the purity of Christian faith. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bruce, Bruce again. <laughs> no, just, uh, really fast. Thank you for, for being patient. So, so are you saying, Professor, that this rich data trove would point the Inquisition court to the assets, where they might be, how they might be um, better confiscated and inventoried? Is, is that yes, I, the detail that's coming out of these records as well? It's not the, the, the it's a good question, Bruce. It's not the primary thing they're interested in. Got it. But they are asking about everything, everything. Um, you, who's having secret love affairs with whom? Where did you buy your donkeys? Um, you know, who made the carpet? I mean, they're interested in everything, uh, which of course means that from a sort of historical or anthropological point of view, these are amazing resources about the period. Um, but it's also uh, a dragnet. It's also a dragnet. It is a dragnet. And, and Lucena, who is, who is a, a tradesman, uh, shares, for example, in this handwritten letter to his wife, he tells her exactly who he owes money to, and and you know who the merchants are who are about to come into town, and because she has to handle his business while he's in prison, so it, it does provide information about that. But it is not what their questions are focused on. Their questions are focused on heresy. That doesn't mean that they don't have an ulterior motive. That's a, you're asking a very very good question. Uh, one of the people who worked very closely with me, and who's a, a big uh, contributor to the book uh, is, is a, a Berkeley librarian who specializes in the period. And he used these documents of the Inquisition to figure out about trade routes, sort of sort of map the economics, sort of how is gold being moved? Uh, how is silver being moved from the mines? Who is selling equipment to the miners? Who's bringing them food? Uh, donkey trails, which are you know the earliest form of roads in this part of the world. Um, so you could certainly have used it for that purpose. I think if the Inquisition was really primarily about money, they would have asked uh, more leading questions. Maybe they did and the scribes didn't write them down. I don't know. Could be. Uh, David, I have not looked at questions in the chat. I'm assuming that you're- We're, 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 we're running through them. Um, there's um, observation from, from Kevin, who hasn't got a mic. Um, he, he says that in the 1700s, out of 500 uh, plus trials in Mexico, only two were for Judaism compared with South America, where the Inquisition was uh, rampant. I don't know what the question is, and it's it's also not so it's an observation. I think. Yeah, it is an observation. I, I yes, it, it it confirms. I guess it it links to your con prior conversation with me, David, about the fact that the that the community in Mexico had dwindled very very significantly. Uh, there ju there just aren't that many Jews that you can find anymore, and I suspect that those was it two or five. You said two. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that those were newcomers, because if they had not been newcomers you would expect that they would have family members, sisters, brothers, parents, grandparents, who would have also been caught up. It's very strange to imagine, you know, all of Mexico. Uh, he, he says priests. Two, priests. Oh, okay. It's, it's hard to imagine like two Jews, right? Like where's the rest of the family? Yeah. I, I have to say, uh, you, 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 you use the word Jew. I, I, I would often be using the word new Christian. Yes. In, that's in entirely fair. Head. And in fact, we can, we should try to distinguish, although it's very hard to distinguish, between conversos in the strict sense of the term. They, they are new Christians, and they are truly Christians. Mm -hmm. And the accusations, as Netanyahu would say, are unjustified. Uh, it's primarily jealousy from 
uh, from, from others, from old Christians, that leads to false accusations of Judaizing that have, that have no foundation in reality. Um, Muranos, who are uh, pretending to be new Christians, but are in fact just old Jews, um, that's, that's the riddle that the Inquisition is trying to solve. In many cases, it knows that these are people who were once Jews and who converted in 1492. What it doesn't know is whether that conversion was sincere or not. Yes, yes. Um, Ton, shall we uh, wind up? You're, you're muted. You are still muted, Ton. Okay, I will. I'm not quite sure what's happened to uh, Ton's. Um, um, oh, you are unmuted. Yes. At this point, uh, we have to uh, remember Prof Professor Hasner about his next appointment coming up. And uh, we heard a lot of things. Um, a lot of that was uh, new, new to me. And um, we are going to digest all this information in the coming weeks. Uh, Fantastic. It was such a pleasure. And if any of you have uh, questions, uh, please feel free to reach out, reach out to me. My email is my last name, Hasner, uh, at Berkeley. That's the name of the university, uh, dot uh, edu. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, chat with all of you, even with Bruce, who is at Stanford. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we should say your, your book isn't insanely expensive like uh, most of uh, most academic texts tend to be. Uh, that's right. It's, it's also not very fat. Um, so you can you can you can read it in a you can read it in a quick afternoon. Great. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Hasner. Uh, thank you to all our patrons who are here with us partly and all the others who uh, support us. Uh, thank you to our viewers on YouTube. And uh, we hope to uh, see everyone next week again. And uh, we'll announce our speaker uh, during the week. Thank you all. And see you. And thank you again, 